so welcome, welcome to our uh, sadly non non uh, in person session for our capstone course. We're glad to have uh, Trish with us, who has been our fearless leader through PLCs. I miss. I was getting all excited about wiring up those PLCs, and then and then we got we got virus. Um, so our our purpose today is to try to figure out what kind of pathways we want to take through the end of the course. Um, this is officially, um, well, I guess actually unofficially, <laughs> the uh, capstone course for the data analytics project for those of you that are trying to get the degree or the certificate. Uh, so um, with that being the case, I feel like we should try to have a, a strong end, um, whereas other classes might be able to cope with a bit more of a, a fade away or, or a trickle out, uh, as it were. Um, but uh, we really, uh, I want, I, I think a good degree or a program should have a culminating uh, experience associated with it, and we'll see what we can do in this environment. Um, I see we got uh, Jill. Jill chimed in. Jill, hello. Just want to say hi. Um, make sure everyone feels welcome. Um, so we've got a, a couple of options, and I'm going to uh, screen share here uh, to my desktop and just brainstorm a little um, on a text editor so that we can really see something. Oh, wrong way. Uh, can any uh, can someone verify that this is visible? Can you see my. It's visible. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, that's a little big. Um, so uh, I'd say a, a goal of the capstone is a we would say um, a culminating project that involves a couple of things, um, some sort of question uh, or inquiry, some sort of data analysis, and uh, some sort of presentation and sharing. So at the highest level, we, wanna, we were thinking of doing this with our hardware tools. Um, I have a feeling, and maybe Trish could chime in on this. I have a feeling that we're they're probably going to extend the uh, the online through the end of the term. Um, Trish, do you have any sense of that? I I, I haven't heard, but I'm pretty sure uh, that's probably going to happen because we only have what two weeks right now. I know we're closed through the 19th. So yeah. so even if even if we did have a a, a final tour session together. It's probably not enough time to get hardware going again. Um, so um, in the spirit of trying to get these three components in, we, we've got a, a few options in my mind. Um, one, one bold option would be um, for those of you that are very interested in hardware and that feel like you have the capabilities um, tool-wise and um, fortitude-wise, we could try to, um, I, can, I, can, I can ship you at least our, our Pi boards, um, or we can arrange for you to get those picked up uh, along with uh, little electronics kits. I have, a, I have a, a, a bunch of gear myself, and we might be able to ask Trish if if we could use some of those um, uh, little Arduino boards to go with the Pi. Um, and I have a bunch of extra sensors. Um, so the option there is, is unfortunate because um, you, whatever you did, you'd, you'd have to do in a, in a self-contained kind of way. So a project, uh, it would probably come down to some sort of um, uh, sensing project related to uh, cars, pedestrians uh, in your area. Um, 
I did something kind of like this. I got one of the sound sensors. I live on a busy street, South Braddock Avenue, and, and I, I set something up just in a day of, of counting cars using, um, using their sound signature. Um, so there's a bunch of ways that I suppose you could certainly come up with a, a hardware project. It's just um, debugging would be uh, trickier unless you're willing to do most of that on your own. Um, um, so that's an option. Um, the other option that I want to share with you this morning is a, uh, a purely, so a non-hardware uh, computer-based data analysis related to transport. Um, our, our goal is to have something transport related since our tuition is being paid by a grant from Metro 21, or excuse me, Mobility 21 Center at CMU and of which CCAC is a partner. Um, so in order for you to um, compare these two options, I'd like to share with you a little framework that I came up with for a capstone related project around transport policy, um, which I've been cooking up over the last couple hours. Um, so if you want to join me uh, on that, and if Trish has ideas of how PLC manufacturing kind of stuff can get uh, included in this, um, that's great. I'm, I think there probably actually are ways that it could be done. I'm just not sure what they are. Um, so here on our schedule, it's this link here, Capstone Project Specs. Um, this, by the way, anyone recognize this? Oh, I guess I put it in the um, caption. Uh, this is the Tesla, the Tesla self-driving truck. Uh, very swanky looking. Look, see how the centered oh. seat and everything. <laughs> um, pretty incredible. Uh, this, I think this was the one that did that. The first trip of it was the Budweiser truck from, I think it was Cheyenne, Wyoming to um, Denver. Uh, and that was back in 2017 or something. So um, I included that because there's lots of rich transport policy related field uh, questions to think about. Um, so I want to digest this diagram with you, which is a way that I'm created an idea for a project um, and as usual with my projects and such I don't uh, I, I don't mean for any of it to be restrictive or I don't want it to feel like they're restraints but rather ideas or guides that can be adjusted based on your particular pathway um, so this is this is an attempt to give you a possibility of doing a project that has some focus on transport data and in the world of transportation data it seemed my first draft actually was very general and wasn't related specifically to policy um, but I realized that that might be a little too general for folks so I, I created this uh, conceptual overview where uh, the proposal would be you choose a domain and uh, a subdomain. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use an example together uh, of something that I've always been kind of interested in, which is highway uh, highway traffic and big big trucks. Um, so I'm gonna rework my screen here for just a second. So if you can uh, click with me on this link to the Penn and Turnpike Special Hauling Permits and Restrictions page, um, the overall oh wait. Uh, that looks like the wrong link. One second. Oh, look, it is the wrong link. Countdown, how fast can Eric change a link? Um, pretty fast. Uh, Gah. There it is, special hauling restrictions. Get ready, everyone get your hand, hover over F5, get ready. Get ready on your F5. It's coming. Uh, okay, uh, F5, the miracle of the internet. Um, so if you F5, this should now be, 
this would be the special holiday. Yep. Okay, so the the idea, for example, you've probably been on the highway when uh, you've seen the flag or the lead the lead cars moving a, uh, a sandwiching a big truck that says oversized load. Um, I'm guessing you've all had that experience and had to decide: is it, Am I allowed to pass these things? Is it going to run me over? Uh, this. Oh yes, yes, it might. You gotta be careful. And um, that's Loretta. Um, so this is the policy from the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission that specifies when you need a permit for carrying a uh, a large truck on the highway. Say hi. Say hi. Loretta says hi, everybody. Hi, Lou. <laughs> hi, Lou. Um, she's also very interested in heavy vehicles, as you can see. Um, she's she's a very uh, tenacious kitty. Um, so if you, um, I, over the years, learned a little bit about trucking. So a standard max weight on a truck, on an 18-wheeler, would be about 80,000 pounds, so about 40 tons. And um, it is it is very much illegal to drive an overweight truck on the highway. Does anyone know why it is illegal to drive an overweight truck on the highway? It might be dangerous. Why? I don't know. Okay. So dangerous Road. one. It's actually Road wear. Pardon? Road wear? Yes. Or like damage to the road? Exactly. Road wear. Um, the the, the uh, road surfaces are uh, engineered to cope with certain point loads um, when when they're designed by civil engineers uh, a point load that exceeds the rated maximum can increase wear on a road by a factor of 10 or even a hundred uh, on things like bridges and such and so it's actually quite common a major thing that highway police do is is patrol trucks that they believe may be overweight you've probably crossed state lines and seen those um, control structures that say all trucks must exit here or exit if the trend if your transponder indicates such um, those are primarily for enforcing axle weight restrictions um, and some trucks uh, not only does your truck have to weigh within the bounds but the weight has to be distributed among the axles evenly again so that the the roadway is not unduly stressed. So this is a, an example of a policy that spells out when you need a permit and there are certain situations in which the, uh, S, the truck is large enough that an escort vehicle would be required in addition to the permit. So this is uh, if it's over 90 feet, if it's over 11 feet wide, if it's over 11 feet six between this particular interchange, so uh, the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission has created this policy and is enforcing it using some variety of policy enforcement mechanisms. And so as an example for this, to make this chart concrete, um, a way that we could approach a, a project would be choose a policy context. So we could say the current policy context with regard to overweight vehicles has a policy maker, which would be the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission. And who, who are some impactees of this policy? The obvious ones and maybe some less obvious ones. Who, who's affected by whether or not this policy is um, sensibly created? Truck drivers and their companies. So definitely truck drivers and their companies. So they would have financial impacts for fees. Um, what other kind of impacts would they have? How are they impacted? Uh, logistically, for example, um, it might dramatically increase costs if uh, you have a run a business in which you are attempting to route stuff over this bridge and you have to reroute. You have um, the, the, the process of pulling over and getting the permit affects 
uh, the timing of your customers and client relations. Um, so that's obvious with the truck drivers. Who else is impacted by this policy? Who are the other impactees? So this is part of this question of how are current impactees affected by the policy? So trucks are the easy ones. Other vehicles on the road. Other drivers on the road. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What, how, how are they impacted? Um, I guess safety wise, the policy impacts their level of safety while driving. Um, yes. And, uh, an interesting question might be, um, to what degree, uh, does adherence to the oversized vehicle policy reduce, uh, accidents a reduced risk to uh, to non truck drivers. So you could imagine a situation where the actual risk to drivers is not whether the truck is fifty thousand pounds or one hundred and fifty thousand pounds, but rather whether it's ten thousand pounds or fifty thousand pounds. You know, once a truck gets so big, it's an obstruction and it's big enough to cause danger to other cars. So in that case this policy may actually have very little impact. The, the specifics of the policy may have very little impact on driver safety at the level that the policy kicks in, which is over 100,000 um, pounds. So these are the kinds of policy questions the data can help us answer. Um, so obviously truck companies uh, impact are impacted by fee costs. Uh, logistical restrictions. Um, so uh, Michael has done his duty online. Who, how else? How who else is impacted by an oversized vehicle restriction policy? I'm, tr I'm turning you into policy analysts. You see, it's my sneaky, it's my sneaky goal. There's there's always easy ones, and then there's much there's downstream impactees that I want you to start thinking about as you brainstorm the possibilities. Let's take a look more at some of these uh, these uh, examples as you think. Again, who are the downstream impactees? <clears throat> um, customers must carry a hard copy of the permit. Uh, electronic tolling now. Let's see about an escort vehicle. So escort vehicle is required. Uh, so that means hiring a uh, an escort vehicle company most trucking companies probably hires a third party for that um, if you're over 11 feet wide bumper overhang of five foot from front or 15 foot on the rear um, it would be interesting to figure out this has a kind of a catch-all clause or at the discretion of the turnpike commission due to safety concerns um, so it might be interesting to see if there's any way that we could find data on how often does the Turnpike Commission say, oh, well, I know those are the listed ones, but maybe they have a, a pattern of um, maybe if it's an object that's, that's particularly prone to falling off, like those big, those big trailer modular homes that are super wide and probably not very heavy. Um, so things like that. Uh, when a police escort is required, if total vehicle length is over 160 feet, that's a very long truck, um, an escort by the Pennsylvania State Police Troop T. So let's keep brainstorming. Who, who else is impacted and how by this kind of policy? Are you, are any of you impacted besides in, besides as drivers on the road? Law enforcement is impacted, isn't it? Absolutely, how so? I mean, they have to enforce the rules. Must enforce rules, and for them to enforce rules, they have to undergo what? Training. Yep, and if they're trained for oversized rule restrictions, they are not being trained on some other policy. 
Um, so there's uh, a major a major consideration in policy analysis is what are uh, opportunity costs associated with policy implementation. Meaning, an opportunity cost uh, is. Can anyone define opportunity cost? Any econ people out there? It's a very specific definition. Cost of not doing something else. Like if you go to college, you're for four years, you lose four years of wages. So that's your opportunity cost because you're not working. Yes, exactly. So it is the value of the next best alternative that you are not doing. Alternative that is not chosen. So assuming they're mutually exclusive, the training cops or training law enforcement on enforcing oversized vehicle restrictions, the next, what's the next best thing that they could be trained on? Maybe it's, um, maybe it's um, e equality and enforcement in our, in our age of, um, we have a, a lot of uh, claims of racial bias in our policing system. So, you know, there's, there's opportunity costs associated with having a policy that has to be enforced, um, absolutely. Um, so law enforcement, thanks Jill, thanks Kayla. Um, and uh, certainly taxpayers. So in terms of uh, road maintenance, costs increase as policy adherence decreases. Uh, and that's, and that's, a, that's a fact of physics. Um, side note on this, I had a, uh, when I ran an Airbnb in my house, one of my uh, tenants was coming through to, he was a grad student and he was actually, he was, uh, he and his professor were developing a new ultrasonic testing tool that would be mounted on a truck that would shoot sound waves into a highway to determine the, the integrity of the sub layers in the roadway. Um, and so there's a great deal of infrastructure that's associated with checking and maintaining and updating and deciding on when roads need to be fixed and at what point does a road's um, deterioration impact safety versus speed and those kinds of things. Um, so this was just a brainstorm to give you a sense of uh, what the possibilities are in terms of uh, this kind of analysis. Where did I go? Uh, yes, here. So that would be the policy context analysis. Um, and some, some of these might be easier to find out than others. So on, on what basis was the current policy formed? Uh, it would be interesting. I have a feeling that with a couple of phone calls, uh, phone calls, not emails, uh, with a couple of phone calls to the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, you could probably talk to a human that was involved in writing this policy. And you could figure out, how did they decide what the limit is? When, how do they figure out that it's 100,000 pounds? How, which civil engineer firm was probably, there's probably a study out there about, probably a bunch of studies about when, when, uh, or when, when the risk becomes high enough that you need some sort of uh, permit or, or something. Um, so ultimately, we'd want to start thinking about then what are the deficiencies in the current policy context? So uh, I chose this because I'm interested in roadways and, and this kind of permitting question. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of uh, current deficiencies other than uh, the fact that it's, it's using public, public goods and we could ask, is it, is it being done the most efficiently or, um, you, you might determine that uh, there are no deficiencies. So a policy analysis doesn't necessarily have to be based on a problem. Um, it could also be based on a, a verification of the current policy. So the idea would be you choose a policy like this, something specific that's related to transport that, that you're interested in. And remember, we can be very broad. It could be uh, vehicles, pedestrian, uh, pedestrian accessibility, almost any mode that, that you can think of uh, that has existing policy around it. So uh, 
um, blimps, for example, uh, the policy context for operating blimps uh, is probably rather small. Um, and so you might, you might come up short in terms of data. The reason I chose transport is because um, we have access to, if you go back to our capstone page, if you, this, this data set, crash incidents in PA, um, this is probably one of the most comprehensive crash data sets in the country. Uh, it is several million rows, almost 3 million rows with 180 fields. Um, I've had a chance to um, spend a little bit of time with this data set. It's extremely rich. And so it lends itself to crash related policy questions. Not only is there a whole bunch of rules about traffic that have been debated over time and have some policy trail to go with it, but this, uh, there's enough detail in this data set that you can do all sorts of neat things. Like not only obviously we can figure out where it is uh, time, but look at kind of the neat things. Was there a lane closure? Was there, um, a traffic control device involved, a stoplight? Was there a detour? Was it a work zone? Um, how many vehicles? What kinds? Buses, motorcycles, small trucks, heavy trucks, SUVs, uh, uh, injury counts of various uh, various types. How old were the drivers? Uh, look at the, the gradation, 16, 17, 18. What we know is that people are really, really bad drivers when they're young. They're not, they're not good at figuring out and uh, judging the different risks. So they did a nice job of breaking down ages in those early years, very fine, fine. Um, it's interesting, they jumped. So then they, the, the middle-aged drivers started, I su I'm surprised they don't give you a 21 to 25 because that one's also a high risk. Um, you get a bunch of gradations in years, um, how many people were seat belted, how many seat unseat belted people died. Um, how many people wearing a seatbelt died? Uh, bicycles, pedestrians, commercial vehicles, roadway surface type. Um, state who, who maintained the road? Was it on the turnpike? Was there snow? Was there ice? Was there a deer? Sudden, sudden deer. I guess if the deer was standing there and just milling about, it doesn't, I don't know if that's a sudden deer. They have to be, I don't know. Um, was there a rear end? Uh, um, intersections, school buses, did the deer get hit? Was there a tree? Did the shrub jump out? Those, those shrubs, you got to watch out. Uh, they're, they're a pretty wild bunch. Um, heavy truck. So this would be where I would zoom in and, and start with how many, how many big trucks were involved in crashes since 97? Um, how many times did trains hit things? You've got a whole bunch of, oh, this is cool. Anyone know what a phantom vehicle is? I didn't either until I started working on this. Uh, phantom vehicle is a, a registered category for vehicles that were involved in a crash potentially, but may not have, they did not touch any other vehicle in the crash. So um, you could have, it is, it is possible to actually have a, a custom or a phantom vehicle Indicates if a phantom vehicle, if phantom vehicles are involved in a crash, made no contact with other unit in the crash. Uh, a phantom action unit's actions may be the reason for a crash. Anyway, so I, I chose this because this is a data set that is ready to roll, um, and it's big enough that if you put it in a spreadsheet, it would it would it would crap it out. Uh, two and a half million rows will destroy, especially two and a half million rows with 100 plus columns is not something you could do in Excel. Uh, and if you did, you'd have to have a bunch of RAM and I would be very impressed. So um, it's a data set that's large. It exists, so you don't have to spend a lot of time looking for it. And um, it's very relevant because traffic accidents are the leading cause of death of Americans age 20 to 35 or something. It's it's uh, about 30,000 people a year die from traffic injuries. So it's a very relevant um, topic of policy. Um, so back to our little capstone. So you choose a policy context and then find a data set. And then we pump it into a tool. And um, this is a chance for you to learn 
learn some new tools. Uh, I'm going to actually see if I can put Michael on the spot. He's, he's a, a, uh, uh, a pretty, um, pretty uh, committed self uh, investigator of things. And he just told me about this algorithm. Could you tell us a little bit about why I have this up on my screen, Michael? Um, yeah, so this algorithm looks at correlation between um, transaction data from a, in the retail industry. Um, basically, it groups um, all transactions and the different products that each transaction consists of. Um, and then based on all of these different transactions, it finds um, products that are most correlated. Uh, the, I guess, best example um, is when people shop at grocery stores. Um, when people buy diapers, they also typically buy beer. Um, which <laughs> is, uh, I think it's kind of like a, it was just the example that they use. But um, those types of informations are used to help retailers uh, figure out um, different product sets to keep together, uh, maybe from a visual standpoint, putting them next to each other in the store or um, from an inventory amount uh, type of um, metric. You're, you're trying to make sure that you have enough of each inventory or if one goes down, um, you can forecast that the other one should be uh, going down as well. And if you see sales rise in one of those areas, you should um, probably make sure you have enough inventory of the other. Great. So this is an example of Michael. Uh, this comes from your work domain of um, retail, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, part of the uh, exciting thing about doing a project like this is that I'll, you'll be invited to, to learn a new tool, uh, a, a new uh, analytic tool, uh, or, or beef up on ones that you already know. Um, and I'm here and Trish is here and, and we have the disposal of the Mobility 21 office that knows a whole lot of data analysts. And so if you, if you chose a policy context and had a question, I, I'm sure that within a phone call or two, we could get you talking to an actual professor who could point you in the direction of uh, something like this a priori algorithm that would be relevant in your policy domain. Um, so we have, a, we have kind of a neat opportunity here because we are part of this grant funded project that uh, people are, I, professors, it's what they do. They work on grant funded projects, uh, at least at CMU, that's a major thing they do. And so um, we could, we, once you have a stake in the ground, so to speak, we can get you whatever resources I think you would need to try to undertake uh, a real uh, analysis with some weight uh, in, in the domain that you're interested in. So I listed just some examples, um, linear regression. Uh, some of you are in the R class, um, then working on regression. We learned from Mark. We had Mark speak earlier. He's more than happy to help uh, walk you through some, some analyses. There's some simpler ones like a, a moving average analysis. So just how do you uh, use uh, previous years and weight the averages from, it's called a weighted rolling average to predict future values based on the average of the past several values. So there are more and less complex tools depending on uh, your focus. So some of you may say, uh, I want to spend my time working on cleaning. Maybe you find a really uh, yucky looking data set that takes a lot of time on the cleaning end, in which case your analytic tool might be slightly less new or less complex. Some of you may say, oh, I'm going to use the, the crash data that's already cleaned. And then you could focus on, I want to, I want to focus on regression and I want to predict how many crashes we think might happen if we decrease the speed on the turnpike to 50 miles an hour. And um, you'd have to hire an entire staff person just to deal with the angry emails coming from drivers across the state. Um, so uh, you throw it into an analytic tool and then come up with some data back claims that are analytic. And then the policy process is then step back and say, how is it related to our policy context? So maybe in, in our case of the 
oversized vehicle restriction, we we do a, a search and we figure out how many crashes were related to large heavy trucks, and we could say um, the maybe the analysis comes out and says actually what we find is most of the crashes are actually incident to trucks that are under where to go where to go come back uh, this is death by tab um i probably closed it you know maybe the the analysis comes out and says many crashes are happening with with trucks at the 50 foot length um, so maybe what we actually want to do is revise the permitting process to encourage the permitting to occur for vehicles of a different size um, and thinking about how many how many vehicles this might apply to could you find some data on uh, the frequency of use of trucks of various kinds uh, this is a kind of stage that would happen here of well let's make some proposed changes to the policy so based on your analysis how might current policy be changed to address the needs or concerns of your impactee um, so maybe uh, i bet you could call a couple of trucking companies and say and and ask them do you find that the permitting process for oversized vehicles is onerous is is it impacting your work? And they say, oh yes, it's terrible. You know, 90% of our trucks have to go through permits and the permits aren't issued in a consistent time frame. So that means that we can't provide clients with a consistent arrival time. So you, you may be able to actually connect it to a specific impact D group like uh, trucking companies or uh, law enforcement or uh, passenger vehicles sharing the road. Um, something to think about. Uh, what degree of uncertainty would be associated with your proposal? You may do some analysis and find that you can't come to a strong conclusion. And so your uncertainty would be very high. Um, and then something about costs. Who would have to pay for a change? And then I made a, a little companion bubble box Oh, somewhat box, somewhat bubble thing. Um, banner, it's like a banner, uh, a banner, a policy context with proposed changes. So describing what are, well, what does your new policy situation look like? Um, so again, the, the possibilities are, are very broad. Uh, there's a whole lot of current policy discussion about the uh, autonomous vehicles and CMU does a bunch with that. So that could happen a bunch. Um, I'm also interested in trains a bunch, and trains are uh, the bygone era in the U.S., but in many countries, most other, most other countries, European and East Asian countries, tra trains are uh, predominant. So you could look in other countries for examples of policies that have encouraged railway use and what kinds of, um, what kinds of, ways have they done that so your analytic tool remember could be mapping you know a lot of a lot of us in this course have gone through the 201 class and we've worked with QGIS you could you could propose uh, actual new bikeways or um, or railways uh, using the existing grid that's the kind of thing that you could totally get a job with the Department of Transportation having done a good solid project um, on proposing a new a new pedestrian route. I think you could get a, a get an entry level job with something like that. So um, I cook this up as a way of suggesting that I, I think we should not lose hope. That we I think we could get an interesting project done in in a in a month and a half or so. Um, I'm wondering now that I've been dumping onto the interwebs here for forty minutes. Um, why don't we? Jump open your little your group chat and uh, let's let's all can I just get a get a poll so um, I'm gonna type it out here on the screen so let's let's see uh, if you can please uh, indicate 
uh, your preliminary leaning. So I just want to get a sense, and Trish and I to get a sense, uh, leaning between uh, trying to do hardware in the hardware at home. We'll call it hardware at home uh, versus uh, more rigorous policy analysis like I propose. So uh, a one equals definitely hardware only, uh, policy equals yuck. Um, a five would be uh, completely undecided, and 10 would be I already have a policy in mind, forward hoe. So if you can just take a minute and uh, give us some sort of a scaled sense of where you're sitting, that will, that will help us a bit in, in figuring this out. And the numbers are rolling in. Wow, that's a miracle of the internet. Oh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this because I don't want you to, I guess you're already seeing it. It's, ideally, we'd, you wouldn't be able to see each other's votes. Don't, don't be afraid to be, a, to be a dissenter. What was the policy one? So that would be this framework that I was just explaining. That would be um, doing some... The number, the number. Oh, uh, 10, the 10 side would be strong on the policy side. So uh, 10 would be, I, I'm really interested in the policy world. Okay, we've got a good, uh, it looks like some good rhymes. So to, I think we've got every one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, we're missing a chunk of the class. Um, okay, so we've got, we're, we're very split, it would look like, uh, leaning, leaning on the policy side. Um, so that's a good, well, it leaves us with some questions. <laughs> um, what I'm, or, or I guess let's chime in with, uh, with Trish. Do you, have, do you have ideas now that you've been thinking? Do you have any ways that you think we could still be involved in hardware stuff? Or what are your thoughts here, Trish? Um, I, it's going to be difficult, I think, as far as getting too much into the hardware, but, uh, I mean, I'm certainly willing to, to do what I can. I'm, I'm working on putting together some videos for, uh, PLCs that, you know, could be for another class, but they could certainly be used here. Um, I have some ideas of like simulators that I could use. Okay. Uh, but it is going to be a little bit hard to do the hardware part, I think, you know, at this point, because, uh, I mean, we have just probably a couple days back on campus where we could even run something or, you know, try it. But So at best case, they could, um, now the, the software is not free, correct? It is not, but I read, uh, they are offering a, free 21 day trial oh, okay. of the software. Um, so, and I have talked to Siemens about trying to get that extended, but you know, so far they haven't. So okay, so <laughs> I'm in, hoping they will, cause I know they're getting a lot of requests for that. But. Oh, good. Okay. So in, if, if someone were very interested in the hardware, they might be able to do some of the programming and then when they open campus back up, we could work with them to try to get some time on the hardware potentially. Right. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Um, so that, um, thanks for that being an option. Um, so if uh, we have, what I think makes sense having seen these examples is to, um, is to take a week. And what I've done is I uh, made a little shared Google doc here in my normal uh, now what's become my, my consistent approach for figuring out what people are doing. Um, if you want to go ahead and open this uh, together, I'm going to make 
I'm going to make, uh, I'll give everyone a row. Um, get everybody uh, so if uh, let's I'm gonna add a new column here actually I'm gonna say um, hardware or policy and so Loretta has squarely put her pause in policy um, so maybe we can I can propose that this week you take some time and do some thinking on, uh, since it seems like some of, most of you are in the middle of not, not quite, uh, since I just dropped this out of the sky on you, this is expected. So um, with these tools in mind and having heard from Trish about possibilities, um, why don't we take the week and uh, make a decision for yourself of which way you want to go and I can't even, I'm not even supposed to get to campus uh, for a couple more days. Um, so I think, let's see, when is the fifth? The fifth is, oh no, the fifth is next Sunday. Um, Trish, do you know if they'll even let us into West? I was told that you could go escorted, but it, it's just gotta be go in, grab something and leave. Okay. And through the sixth, so. Okay. so. Um, through the six. So if you, um, the earliest that I'd be able to mail you out the, um, the, uh, uh, pie kits would be ne a week after next probably. Um, so keep that in mind as you, as you think about your, your situation. If you, if you're leaning on the policy side, um, I put in some columns for you to start just assembling your, your world based on the diagram that I came up with. So this is just an organizer for you. If these aren't the right columns, then make your own columns. <laughs> um, you can add a new sheet and, and say, I'm, I'm doing my own thing. Um, I'm very much a supporter of, of people lone wolfing. Um, so don't, don't be overwhelmed by this. It's just me trying to give us some structure in a land of, of uncertainty. Um, so in our case, Loretta would have chosen um, highway travel, and then it would be oversized vehicle uh, restrictions and permitting. This would be the Penna Turnpike Commission um, truck companies. Actually, maybe it would be trucking companies and. Um, roadway maintenance engineers um, so this uh, this is a, an organizer for us to work on and what I'd propose is next week uh, by next week I'm going to have figured out how to do these small group um, uh, tools on zoom apparently there's a way to break do break off rooms and so I will uh, it'll be important if you can try to have some um, if you want to do hardware, uh, maybe make your own little tab and describe what you're thinking for hardware. Uh, otherwise, if you can try to have something populated by, by way of domain and subdomain um, by next Thursday, Friday morning-ish, I will do some thinking on how we can best use some online time uh, and start doing some thinking on what would be the analysis tools that would be helpful. Um, and then we can try to get you hooked up with people at, at CMU and, and uh, the, the Department of Transportation.